Hello, everybody. Frank Gladstone will be here in just one moment. Hi, everyone. Oh, it's my granddaughter welcoming you to this third video blog with me, Frank Gladstone. And I'm going to answer some questions that we've received since the last blog, and uh, I will do my best to answer them. So here we go. Anthony asks, I'm a sci-fi screenwriter and I've just completed a screenplay for an animated sci-fi feature. I use Blender to create and render the main character. I'm working on putting together a short commercial to showcase the character and advertise the script on YouTube in the hopes that a major studio may want to pick up the franchise. Any advice? Well, that's one way to approach things, I guess. Um, it's, uh, it's a long shot, I must say. You know, having something on YouTube that you've animated uh, or is, uh, is one way to get some attention. I don't know if it will, it's, it's hard to say. I don't know people who've gotten jobs as animators on, by posting something they've animated, but I don't know anybody who's sold a script, an animated feature script, by putting something on YouTube. It could happen. As William Goldman famous said about Hollywood years ago, slightly out of context, no one knows anything. So it could. Uh, on the other hand, if you're thinking that I'm gonna, you're gonna show some animation to somebody and they're gonna want your animation or they're gonna want your character design or anything like that, that's an even longer shot. Uh, and you're looking for a major studio to spend millions of dollars and sometimes many years doing something, they're going to want to have a lot of say in that because they're the ones who are taking big risk. So, uh, you know, most of the, uh, of the films that I know about have started, either they were a book or they were a, an existing story or they may have started inside the studio. Um, and, uh, they go through lots and lots of changes and generally um, uh, first designs or things that somebody has designed don't really um, um, survive the various changes that a major uh, studio picture uh, will generally, generally do. On the other hand, uh, television might be a little more uh, open to this kind of thing, but they don't do features or they wouldn't be doing features. They'd be thinking about your show as a series. Um, it's not the best way. It's not, I'm not telling you that you shouldn't do it, but using a YouTube trailer as a pitch, well, if you're gonna have fun, do it. Just realize that there's a, it, it's a slim chance. And even if it was found interest, the studios, if it's a real major sci-fi picture with a big budget kind of scope to it, they're going to want to have a lot of say in what it looks like and how it's animated and, and so forth. So there you are. I hope that answered your question or at least gave you some things to think about. Uh, Prema has asked me, Prema Rose has asked me, uh, uh, with a, an animated live action musical, the budget is about $15 million. What are the avenues that I suggest to, pers to pursue to produce in this range? Well, Prema, I mean, a film like that, a project like that, that already had, if you already have the budget, the budget, you could go ahead and self-produce it. Um, you probably need some expertise. You probably have to get somebody who's a producer, uh, somebody who's maybe somebody who's a director to be on your crew. And then you would find a, a uh, studio that would be willing to do it within the budget. There'd be a lot of pre-production work and storyboard work and asking, uh, uh, for voice talent and then self-produce it. And in doing so, you could look for a distributor, which will be, which would, is gonna be your next big thing. You look for a distributor and then um, uh, while you're doing it or as you're doing it, uh, look for the, that distributor so that when it's done, you have distribution. I've known some shows that have produced all the way through and finished it and taken it to Cannes or another film market to try and find the distributor. One of the major pictures last year, something I called I Lost My Body, was produced that way, produced for very small money in France uh, with an animated producer who believed in the project and got a director and managed to do it for a very low budget and then took it to Cannes, uh, I think it was Cannes or one of the major festivals where it proceeded to uh, get a lot of attention right there. And then eventually Netflix picked it up for a distribution 
in uh, the United States and North America, and I don't know what other territories, but that's how that happened. But it was self-produced initially. So I would not try and self-produce it without some expertise, somebody who's done this kind of thing before, and uh, um, go through those development processes and then make it. But $15 million, you can make an animated, animated movie today for $15 million. So, but uh, if you don't have the money, that's a different story. You're gonna have to convince an investor to, or investors, or you kickstart it to, to raise the money. But if that's the budget and you think that's a reasonable budget for the movie, then kind of what I outlined. Uh, find a studio, find a, uh, the expertise in the front, production designer, director, storyboard, uh, head of storyboard, so forth, associate producer. And uh, you produce it all over the world. Studios or st studio or studios in other countries or in the United States, depends, who can do it for that kind of money. Uh, first, find yourself a really good producer. Um, next is uh, Brandon, who I've talked to before. Uh, for a small studio that has done what you recommend uh, in my prior videos, completed uh, complete some projects and produced a show or two, but have very few contacts in the industry. What's the best way to get in front of decision makers who can produce green light shows? Gee, if I knew that, Brandon, I'd, <laughs> I'd be rich. <laughs> um, there's lots of ways to do it. One we talked about with Anthony, make a YouTube pilot and hope somebody sees it and likes the idea and wants to work with you on developing it. Uh, or you, you can come out to California for some time, make appointments and go see people and pitch your story that way. Uh, I, it, 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 for, for large studios, that has to be done. You, you have to visit the places and say, here I am and here's what I wanna do. Um, it also depends on, as, as you know, it depends on the niche you're trying to do and the budget you have whether it's a feature or whether it's for television. Television seems a little more open right now because features are now trying to decide how they're gonna distribute what with COVID and everything like that and probably change the nature of the game somewhat anyway about how, how films are distributed and, and like that. Um, uh, but you, you have to prepare a pitching deck. Uh, that's a, uh, if you're gonna try and do it online, a kind of a very easy, simple, not too complicated uh, pitching deck that shows your characters and your idea and gives uh, a, a, a kind of a synopsis of thing. Have a script ready so people can see it. Know that if you're going to work with somebody who's going to put most of the money up, they're going to want to make changes and uh, so forth. Getting in front of them, uh, an agent, a literary agent, or uh, somebody who's representing your work who knows those ropes and can get you in front of uh, players who are interested in doing features or television. I think that's the best thing to do. And, that, and then once your representative gets you um, um, a place, place to be, uh, studios to look at, hopes sets up some interviews, you will go and pitch them. I think that's it. It's not easy, not easy. Or you can raise the money yourself and self-produce, which is possible nowadays. But you, you know that because I think you've done a little bit of that already. Kay says, how do you determine the animation style that best serves a story? I'd also love to know suggestions for animation previs or previsualization. Do they also use storyboards or, or are the, there more reference materials that matter more? Yes, people still use storyboards. It's important, even if they do previs after that, which is often happens nowadays, storyboards are extremely important. If it's a 2D, even more important, but yes, storyboards um, need to be done. They are the kind of skeleton upon which you will hang your story. And it's easy to make your revisions and change your ideas and add things and take things out in storyboard. It gets, it gets it exponentially more uh, complicated as you get into the project. So you want to storyboard. And then there's previs, and previs is especially important. It's used almost always when you're doing a uh, computer generated film nowadays. It's like second storyboard. It's like a class, a, a, a cross between storyboard and layout, meaning 
where the characters are in any given scene, how they react to each other, how they react to the environment, how the camera moves, how it's lit. Uh, so pre-vis is important for that, but uh, the storytelling, the storyboard telling should come first, and then pre-vis builds upon that. Uh, so uh, yeah, you would do that. As far as are there more reference materials that matter more? Well, I don't know what you mean exactly by reference materials. Do you mean like character design and production design or just research? So all of that is important. Uh, and some of that you need early on. You need some form of what the characters are gonna look like. Even when you've gone in a storyboard, you're gonna need some idea of the style of the film um, uh, as you go in, even if, you, if you're not done with that. And that uh, goes to your first question. How do you determine the animation style? That's a good question. The animation style is determined somewhat by the story. It's determined somewhat by the studio that's doing it. If, you, if you're doing an animation at Leica or Aardman, it's gonna be a stop motion. If you're doing a story at one of the major studios, it's gen, uh, US studios, it's generally going to be a CG. If you're doing television, it can be, a, it can be CG or it may be 2D. Um, and so, uh, uh, that depends. And, and you know, sometimes a, an executive or an agent will read a script and say, I think this will go better in, in stop frame, or I think this is, this is perfect for 2D or something like that. So it depends. It's, uh, and sometimes you start with one style you think it's going to be, and it ends up being something else. Uh, that's part of the development process. How it's rightly determined is a decision that's made differently for probably each show I've ever heard of, depending if you're in what studio you're, you're, you're in. You're probably not gonna see DreamWorks or Pixar or Disney or any of those uh, majors, Illumination, doing a stop frame film or a 2D film, but other studios, yeah, sure. So there you go, okay. Hope that answered your question. So how, how we determine what the style is, gut, <laughs> that seems right. You know, I, I was thinking about uh, Spider-Man into the Spider-Verse. How did they determine that style? Well, they said it's kind of computer generated, but it should look like comic books. And that's, and that's kind of where they went. They had a lot of development on that. It's one of the reasons that shows a success and a groundbreaker for our industry. So there you go. Uh, Dan says, thanks for doing this. Thank you, Dan, for writing in the question. Uh, my first question would be, why traditional 2D animation has fallen out of favor for feature length projects in America? That's a good question. Um, CG is more flexible as far as cinematography goes. You're, you can move that camera around just like you could a live action film. Um, I think that's part of it. Part of it is that it, it allowed more things to be done. Part of it, it allows changes to be made even almost up until the movie came out in 2D, you can't do that. Part of it, it required a kind of specialized person who could draw so well. And, that's, and that was always an issue with animation in the old days, how many people could actually do it. And in, 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 uh, in 3D, you have you you can you have to learn the technology, uh, but the inherent drawing skills are you still should have them because it's a thinking process, but it's not absolutely necessary, and it has democratized our industry. It has allowed many many more studios to exist. You know, in the, in the olden days, you had studios in the U.S. and maybe you had a, a few studios around, not too many doing features at all. And now you see it everywhere uh, because CG has democratized and allowed more people to work on it, uh, to, to be available, to learn the technology and the artistic approach. And, uh, and, and that's one of the reasons why in the U.S. Uh, it has kind of all the major studios do it. That doesn't mean it doesn't happen. And as you mentioned in your other part of your question, there have been and there are a lot of great 2D traditionally animated television series out there. Um, and that's true. Now, they are in essence animated on a computer 
sort of too. They use platforms that allow the in-betweening to be done or uh, uh, changes to be made and, and, and the animation to go faster um, and quicker. And, uh, and so in a way, even, and, you, and you're not drawing on paper anymore, you're drawing it into a tablet, which then is read by the computer, which then is placed in the right spot and can be used over and all those things that we used to have to do on cells, on, pla on paper and, pla and plastic sheets. So even the 2D is now worked on, on a kind of a 2D computer. So, but it does allow, and again, it has opened up things a little bit too. Yeah, the drawing skills are still necessary and, and so forth, but you, uh, you can turn around things faster. Many more things can be done and so forth. So that's another thing. Um, let's see, um, see what else you say here. Disney has also been remaking their animated classics into live action. Do the screenwriters or directors have any authority in choosing the style of their film, or do they have to adhere to the demands of the big studios to make 3D CG? Well, 3D CG can be made by small studios. You don't have, it doesn't have to be the big studios. In fact, if you're looking for a low budget, you're probably gonna work CG because you have a, a wider variety of people and studios that can work on your film. So a small a CG doesn't necessarily mean a bigger budget. It it can also mean a smaller budget, as as is two D. There's there was always two D full animation and two D limited animation that that always kind of existed. Uh, you saw a big difference when TV came in that there was much more limited animation being done, more people were seeing it. But it's always been around, and um, so uh, my guess is this, do screenwriters and directors have any authority in choosing? Sometimes if they're important directors, they may, you know, or they may want to work in one thing or another, that's okay. Um, but um, uh, do they have to adhere to the demands of the big studios? The demand comes from the budget and the, and the kind of story you want to tell, you know. I did a picture a few years ago, the budget was pennies on the dollar compared to a Pixar picture, as rightly it should have been. It wasn't, made for the entire broad spectrum of people watching animated films. It was made for preschoolers in this particular case, in early education, you know, the first, second, third grade. Um, uh, so the budget was low. And how we did it? We found a studio in another country who was able to do it. And it was CG, you know? And it, we, they, we used a lot of the same tricks and. And, and approaches that the big studios use and the, the results were fine for what it was. It worked great for what it was. We certainly got our money's worth for a small budget. So when you work for the big studios, again, that's the deal, you know, if they're, if they're spending the dough, they may want to have input. There are studios that kind of, once they determine to do it, say, go right ahead. You, you are the creative guys, go right ahead. And there are studios that do that. And there are executive producers that do that, that say, I have now chosen to do this and I, we're gonna back it, go and do it and, and stay out of it. And then there are studio executives that don't, just like in live action. So do they ask you to carry the ball? They may ask you to stay within budget, but they may or may not be willing to um, leave you to do it so long as you stay within that budget. Um, do you have a few favorite animated films? Yeah, of course. You know, generally I find that people's favorite animated films are the ones they remember first, the ones that had an impression on, on them when they were younger, before they even determined to go into animation or maybe the films that made them want to go into animation. So I have a, films from when I was a kid, Pinocchio. I saw it as a very, Pre, as a preschool kid and remember it when my folks took me uh, to a re-release of it. I wasn't, I'm not old enough to see the original release, <laughs> but I, a re-release I saw with my family and I remember it get, scared the poo out of me with the, the whale. That was really scary, uh, but, it, but it had a profound effect upon me. And then I remember seeing as a little bit older child, um, The Seventh Voyage of Sinbad, which was a hybrid, it's a stop motion, uh, and a, a live action film that Ray Harryhausen uh, did back in the mid-1950s. And it too uh, 
really influenced me. I, I was scared of it. I couldn't believe it. I didn't know how it was done. And in fact, when, when we did figure out how it was done, eventually I put two and two together when I got a little older and figured out how it was done. I wanted to do that. Uh, Ray Harryhausen's uh, films, that film and, and the ones that followed. And, and then I started to see the ones he'd made prior to that uh, were really influential for uh, my whole neighborhood as a kid. We, we were a filmmaking neighborhood uh, to make those kind of films. It was a important for us and me in particular I really wanted to do animation so that is a favorite again because it influenced me as a child um, I worked on a I worked on some several films that I loved because I was working on them and I had a really good run at Disney I worked on Beauty and the Beast Aladdin and uh, Lion King and a little bit on a couple of other ones a little tiny bit on Mulan and a little tiny bit uh, and more on Pocahontas but those three, because I was in the middle of it, uh, mean a lot to me. But basically because I worked on them. And, and they were great films as well. As you know, they, they, were, they were spectacularly successful. And, and I got to be there while they were being successful. And that was, that was pretty good. I worked on um, some pictures at, uh, at, um, when I was at the uh, DreamWorks that were um, difficult to do. And we didn't know that they were going to be successful, and suddenly they were. And that was really interesting, Shrek being, the original Shrek being one of them. And I didn't really have a lot to do with Shrek. I basically loaned office space to, to, their, to their, uh, the heads of their, of their production. But, uh, but, but I was there, and I watched it, and, and you know, it, it, it was a very problematic show. And then suddenly it all clicked, and I watched it be produced, and that, that meant a lot to me. I, did a, I worked on uh, two anime uh, films, one called Millennium Actress by a terrific director named Satoshi Kon, who uh, has since passed away um, too young. Uh, and he made several films. Some of you may know some of those. But I worked on Millennium Actress, which was his second feature, Perfect Blue. And then it was Millennium Actress. And then it was Tokyo Godfathers, I think. And then it was Paprika, or Paprika, depending on how you want to say it. And, he, um, and then he passed. Take this one? I don't think so. Uh, anyway, uh, I worked on, I, I, I helped to bring, didn't really work on it, I helped to bring uh, Millennium Actress to the United States. And, uh, and that was great. And I, I think it's a terrific film to this day. It's very, uh, very well told. It's a little bit magical, uh, magical reality, which all his films seem to be. And uh, it was really pretty great. I also worked on a film with Mamaro Oshi. Ghost in the Shell 2, uh, Innocence. And I didn't work on Ghost in the Shell 1. Uh, and that was a really great experience for me uh, because I liaisoned with, I actually was part of the project and liaisoned with DreamWorks. I was at DreamWorks uh, to help the film get finished and review the shots as they came in. And I actually helped do some of the um, subtitles as well, which was not easy. Uh, and that, that, that meant a lot to me too. There are other pictures. Um, the Incredibles, I thought was incredible. Iron Giant, I, I was at Warner Brothers at the time. I didn't work on it. I was over working on something else, but I watched it start and was real pleased to see it uh, finish the way it did, except that I wish Warner Brothers had believed in it more. Um, uh, there's probably others, but those are the ones off the top of my head. Uh, and and um, oh, I, think, I thought Spider-Verse was just great. I thought that was a Game changer. I love a game changer. Toy Story, game changer. Looking at it, looking at the original Toy Story today, you can see the progress that's been made at Pixar, but uh, it's game changer. Um, so, and I'm sure that when I get off this blog today, I'll say, oh, why didn't I bring, bring up that one and that one? Because there's a lot of them. Um, I teach animation history at Cal State, and uh, there are other pictures that, that, that for their historical. Um, uh, import. Um, they're important too. The first feature was not Snow White. Some of you know it was actually something called The Adventures of Prince Achmed, which will be on Turner Classic Movies this month as they uh, uh, honor women in, in film because it was made basically animated by one person, a woman named Lottie Reininger back in 1925-26. And uh, and it's pretty terrific. It's a cutout animation, stop frame cutout, uh, underlit. 
Uh, she had help, her husband, and a couple of assistants. Uh, but they, that was a film that, uh, that is important to our history. And, and because of that, I think it's great. And plus, I think it's beautifully animated, especially when you know what you had to work with. So I always like the ones where they're up against stuff and they somehow manage to make the movie anyway. There's a lot of films like that. And I guess that comes from my independent background early before I worked for the big studios even. So I think that's about it for this week. That's probably about 30 minutes. Um, I will look at uh, once the uh, <clears throat> once the blog comes out, I try and look at the notes that day. I can't generally do more than that because of my other jobs, but I try and look at the notes that day and answer questions if I can. Uh, so um, if you have other questions, if I can't answer them then, I'll save them for uh, uh, Taylor and I will save them for the next blog. Okay. So hopefully you had a good time. And uh, remember the Velvet Popeye. There it is. Blessings from you, me, and the Velvet Popeye. All right. I'll, take, I'll see you guys. Thanks a lot.